Up next is our final keynote by security analyst Graham Cluley with the title, Not All Cyber Criminals Are Evil Geniuses. Please, Graham, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. And hello, hello, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be speaking at the International Conference on Cyber Conflict, uh, albeit virtually because, well, hey, you know what's going on. <laughs> but what an interesting conference it's been. A tremendous array of knowledgeable experts speaking on a variety of topics. We've looked at the effects of leaks and disinformation through cyberspace, attacks on telecoms infrastructure, discussed international law, the role of artificial intelligence, the challenges of attribution, and how we might better protect critical infrastructure as well. Phew, quite a lot there. Well, there's no denying that cybercrime is a very serious subject and one that impacts the lives and livelihoods of many. And when we hear tales of state-sponsored cyber attacks and the potential for enormous disruption and harm, it's easy, I think, to find things a little bit gloomy. Well, my job today is to reassure you. Yes, there are some very bad actors out there, and some have the resources and the skills to launch serious attacks, but they're very much at the top of the pyramid. The vast majority of attacks, uh, attackers aren't on the payroll of a foreign government, they aren't using sophisticated methods to hack into companies and governments. In fact, they're typically using tricks that we've seen a thousand times before, perhaps using simple social engineering techniques to dupe someone into clicking on a link, run a malicious program, or hand over their password. And yet the media loves to portray the typical cyber criminal as an evil genius with a vast intellect, skulking in their laboratory on top of a volcano, waiting to unleash their devastating attack on an unsuspecting world. So my job today is to say and to ask, is that really the case? Because I've got a hunch that far from being evil geniuses, most cyber criminals are actually just as prone to making dumb mistakes and poor decisions as the next human being. And in fact, they can be rather underwhelming and, dare I say, unimpressive individuals. So why do I say that? Well, let's take a look at a hacking gang right now. A hacking gang that for a while captured the media's attention with its attacks on high-profile targets. This is Lulsec. All your base are belong to Lulsec, said their little meme-like Nyan cat as it flew across the sky. Ten years ago, in June 2011, British newspapers were all talking about one thing. The arrest of what they called the world's number one hacker, a teen cyber mastermind. Well, police in the UK were reported to have swooped on the home of this, quote, global cyber villain. Don't you love the British press? Turned out he wasn't living in a volcano after all, but instead inside a fairly regular house in Essex. Here it is. Now, one tabloid newspaper even managed to grab photographs of the actual inside of the hacker's den. Take a look at this. Well, it's instantly suspicious. How do I know that? Because he has two monitors, clearly the sign of a hacking genius, because what possible reason would anyone else have the need for two screens? And what's that over the window? His window is covered in tin foil, perhaps to prevent intelligence services from using top secret, Mission Impossible style surveillance technology to beam inside the mind of the teenager while he hacked from his bedroom. Or perhaps, like every other teenage boy, he just isn't that keen on daylight. And there's something else odd in the room. 
fucking spot it. It's an air conditioning unit in England. Nobody, trust me, I'm speaking to you from England right now, no one has air conditioning in England. So it must be to cool down a Bitcoin mining rig or maybe there's some more orthodox reason. Well, hey, he, he is a teenage boy. There could be all kinds of noxious fumes and unpleasant smells which he wishes to release into the atmosphere rather than keep them inside uh, stinking out his hacking den. So the question is this, next question from the newspapers, what does this teenage cyber terrorist look like? Well, one newspaper, the Daily Mail no less, if you can call that a newspaper, claimed to have a world exclusive, a photograph of his face, they bragged. Sadly, it wasn't a photograph not a photograph of his current face, unfortunately, uh, but a picture taken of him six years earlier when he was at school when he was aged just 13. There you are, the British press. Uh, so here's a picture of someone quite some time ago when he was a kid. Nonetheless, the media went into a complete frenzy. They described 19-year-old Ryan Cleary from Essex as nerdy, a geek, reclusive and oddball. And here's the thing. Many young people really don't like being called nerdy geeks. They certainly don't like being described as oddballs or portrayed as a little bit strange or, quote, a bit sad. It doesn't fit well with their image of themselves as a hacking mastermind. And so the rest of the Lulsec gang they decided to take revenge. They targeted the Sun newspaper, which had made fun of Ryan Cleary by calling him all those names. They changed the DNS records of the Sun, pointing anyone who tried to reach the Sun's website to a fake version of the site. And that version of the site had a bogus story claiming that Rupert Murdoch uh, who, of course, is the owner of the Sun, amongst many other things, had been found dead in his front garden, having stumbled over a shrubbery. A rather ridiculous story, obviously a joke, but still embarrassing for the newspaper to be hacked in that way because they'd made fun of this hacking gang member. But was this the work of evil geniuses? I don't think so. This was a hack which exploited a simple lack of security. Just like what much of what Lulsec had been doing in its hacking campaigns when they were active 10 years ago. Today, some members of Lulsec are actually out there on the, the speaking circuit. They're giving talks about their hacks and about how they were arrested, and some of them were given custodial sentences as well. Uh, they've become notorious. Really sort of riles me in a way that the people who work hard in cybersecurity, the people who are defending networks don't get those kind of opportunities, and the people who've broken the law sometimes uh, end up being the ones who applauded. Well, Cleary was eventually found guilty, and he was jailed for two years and eight months. There's an up-to-date photograph of him at the time of his sentencing. So he was sentenced for his involvement in Lulsex hacking spree. But really, was he a Cyber terrorist, like the newspaper said, world's number one hacker? I don't think so. He doesn't compare, for instance, with this guy. Let's take a look. This is Albert Gonzalez. He was the mastermind of the TJ Maxx hack, which stole 40 million credit card details and then a further 130 million credit card details from Heartland Payment Systems. Now, you may be thinking that Gonzalez must have been some kind of amazing genius to steal so many credit card details from major companies like TJ Maxx and others. But then, when you read the incident report, you find that this retailer's wireless network was protected using WEP encryption, W-E-P, one of the weakest forms of Wi-Fi security. If you buy a router today, it won't even offer you that level of insecurity. You have to use something better. But web encryption can be cracked in as little as three seconds. 
So it was a technology that was considered obsolete as far back as the early 2000s. But it was still present for Gonzalez and his gang to exploit. And they made cloned payment cards from the stolen details. And they stole a fortune from cash machines. But it's not as though they were being careful not to be spotted, not to stand out in the crowd. Albert Gonzalez spent $75,000 on his birthday celebrations. He had an accomplice who was seven feet tall. <laughs> Just imagine that. Hang on, that was a guy who's seven feet tall. You're going to get spotted. He complained about having to count $340,000 by hand. Imagine that. After his money counting machine broke. One of the pains of being a criminal is when you've got too much money, the technology actually breaks down, making it harder for you to count how much you've made. Gonzalez's crime spree would have continued if he hadn't been caught at midnight one night, emptying an ATM, basically just getting all the money out of it. He was caught by a plainclothes policeman. And normally that would be bad news for a hacker like Gonzalez. But quite frankly, I think it was a lucky break for him. Because Gonzalez did a secret deal with the FBI. He agreed to work undercover to build up a network of contacts that could then be nailed by the feds. Gonzalez agreed to help the FBI with their plan. But in the meantime, and this, this is what I find absolutely astonishing, what he and his crew of hackers did was they kept on hacking. They continued to target businesses, to steal. They went on to steal a further 180 million payment card details from a wide variety of organizations all while working for the FBI at the same time. It's quite astonishing that someone who was working undercover continued to hack and cause. So, and obviously putting himself in huge risk uh, because it was, wasn't like that was going to be taken well. He was already rich. He just couldn't bring himself to stop. Gonzalez bought himself an expensive BMW, designer drugs. He stayed in lavish hotels even hid 1.2 million US dollars in cash in a barrel in his parents' home. Now, understandably, the FBI didn't take kindly to this. They don't, don't tend to like this kind of thing. And when they found out he had carried on his lucrative hacking business while he was supposed to be helping them find criminals, um, they obviously threw the book at him. And the judge at his court hearing, was not impressed either. Gonzalez was sentenced to 20 years in prison. So if you ask me, was Albert Gonzalez a genius? I'd say no. A genius would have seen that he'd been given a chance by the FBI when he was caught, when they said, you've got an opportunity here to change things around. He should have done that. He should have left it at that and not hacked any longer rather than risk his freedom again. Well, sometimes the bad guys aren't the hackers. Sometimes it's the people who are trying to recruit hackers to do their dirty work for them who are the ones we should worry about. This cheery-looking chap is Zachary J. Landis from Pennsylvania, the United States of America. Now, in 2015, he had a problem. You see, he was facing fines and court costs, totaling the grand sum of $16,000 after a series of past criminal misdemeanors and crimes which he had committed. And Landis simply didn't have the money to spare. So what did he decide to do? Well, he didn't have the skills to hack, so he did what he thought was the next best thing he decided to hire a hacker. But if you don't know any hackers, where do you hire one? Well, Landis thought he had the perfect answer to that. He put an advert in Craigslist. Yes, in a Craigslist ad, entitled, and I kid you not, Can You Hack? 
And in that ad, he sought the help of anyone who could hack into the court's computer systems and erase his debts. Remember, he owed thousands and thousands to the judicial system for past misdemeanors and fines. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, the ad was spotted by police, uh, who then contacted Landis, posing as a hacker. They said, oh, yeah, we can hack. We can do whatever you like. We've got the qualifications for the job. And Landis replied, and he shared with them, he even shared with them, the docket sheets from the three court cases associated to the debt, debt that he wanted erased. And at one point, as Landis negotiated with the undercover cop who was posing as a hacker, he actually sent police a screenshot, <laughs> a screenshot of his computer. So he pressed all print screen or whatever it was, sent them the image. And of course, that has a wealth of information which the computer crime investigators were able to, to look into. Unfortunately for Landis, he was logged into his Gmail account at the time, which helped reveal his identity. And after the police contacted Google and Craigslist, uh, they found that the email address belonged to Landis and the advert on Craigslist had been made with his account in his name. It's like, durr, um, wasn't that complicated to prove that he really was the one responsible. Now, Landis was given plenty of time to consider the stupidity of his actions when he was handed a jail sentence of at least 24 months. Depending on his behavior, it could be more. No doubt Landis is pretty disappointed that it was the police who answered his ad on Craigslist rather than a genuine hacker. But who do you complain to when you've got a problem like that? You know, we've all been in the situation, haven't we? I haven't put an, I haven't put an ad in Craigslist saying, hacker, you know, I want to hire a hacker. But we've all been in the situation where we've wanted to make a complaint, right? We've been unsatisfied. We've hit a brick wall. Sometimes you have a problem and it's hard to get a company's attention. What do you do? What do you do when you can't get a, a proper response from a company? Maybe you phone up the chief executive officer. Maybe you send a snotty email to their customer service desk. Maybe you picket their head office, perhaps, or post something really bitchy on Twitter. What I hope you don't do is follow the example of a 35-year-old Belgian known only as Brecht S. He was upset back in 2014 when a branch of the Creeland Bank in a, a suburb of the city of Rosler. His grumble with the bank occurred because uh, his parents had unfortunately got divorced. And he felt that his mother's bank account had sustained losses of some 300,000 euros. And he thought that the bank officials wouldn't meet with him to discuss the matter, which wasn't making him very happy. Now, I don't have a photograph of Brecht so I've got this artist's impression of what he looks like instead. Now, you might think that he might, you know, if he was really, really angry, maybe he would launch a distributed denial of service attack, a DDoS attack against the bank. And if you thought that, you'd be right. That's exactly what he did. He did launch a DDoS attack, and his cyber attacks took the bank's portal down for many hours on multiple occasions. Now, of course, a DDoS attack uses many other people's computers, compromised computers, gets them to bombard a website with traffic. So it wouldn't necessarily mean that it was easy for the authorities to identify Brecht as the culprit. But the next method he used to complain about the poor customer service, which he claimed he had received from this bank, made him rather easier to single out. Because Brecht threw a homemade Molotov cocktail at the bank branch. Now, I don't know if anyone in the audience has ever firebombed a building. I'd like to think that you haven't. But from what I understand, it's a good idea to be a good, a fair good distance away from your target before throwing the cocktail, you know, the burning cocktail um, at, the, at your target. So you need a good forceful chuck 
to lug the firebomb a decent distance. But if you do give it the right amount of welly, if you give it some proper oomph, it does increase the chance that something might fall out of the back pocket of your jeans, like it did for Brecht in the form of a USB stick. And this US thumb B thumb drive, which fell out of its pocket when he was throwing the Molotov cocktail, contained information which identified him as the culprit and led police to his door. And what the Belgian cops discovered was that the DDoS attack against the bank was not the only shady cyber activity that Brecht was engaged in. He also turned out to be a member of the Belgian chapter of the Anonymous Collective, the hacking group. And he was also a member of a, another hacking gang called the Cyber Crew that had previously engaged in attacks against FIFA in the run-up to the Football World Cup. And that's not all he'd done, because Brecht had even launched DDoS attacks against a local pizza parlour. After it had made the mistake of putting anchovies on a pizza his aunt Margot had ordered and refusing to give his... I don't actually know if that is the real reason. I don't know if they did deliver the wrong pizza, but for some reason he was so upset with a local branch of his pizza parlour, he launched DDoS attacks against them. I, I can't possibly explain the thinking of some of these hackers. Okay, we have one final candidate for the dumbest computer criminal of all time, and it is this guy. I wonder, do you remember the Syrian Electronic Army? Between July 2013 and December 2014, the Syrian Electronic Army, a group of pro-Assad hackers, engaged in a criminal scheme. What they did was they hacked into the computer systems of American and other companies around the world. They stole information and then attempted to extort large sums of money. Basically, the kind of thing we're seeing more and more now with ransomware, where they're threatening to release information unless a big payment is made. Now, typically, the attackers from the Syrian electronic army would begin with a carefully crafted phishing email designed to steal the login credentials of an employee at the targeted organization. And if that theft of a user's password was successful, the attackers would then use those credentials to access the business's computer systems. We've heard all this before. Sometimes they'd compromise social media accounts, they'd deface websites, they would meddle with DNS records, or launch further phishing attacks as well. Victims of the Syrian Electronic Army include the International Business Times, Forbes, The Guardian, The Telegraph, Washington Post, amongst many others. Now, according to documents filed in a US court, one member of the Syrian Electronic Army, known only online as The Shadow, don't you love, by the way, the, the kind of names that hackers give each other? It's all sort of grandiose sort of world wrestling names. The shadow is said to have demanded more than $500,000 from up to 14 victims. But the shadow at the Syrian Electronic Army had a problem. And the problem was this. He was based in Syria, which meant that sanctions put in place by the United States and other countries prevented difficult, you know, presented difficulties in transferring funds to his bank account. These were really the days before cryptocurrencies had taken off. But no matter, because the Syrian Electronic Army said it had intermediaries around the world who could work as proxies. Here's an, one of the uh, email communications they had with one of their victims. And what they did was they agreed how much they were going to pay, but they said, all you have to do if you've fallen victim to an attack by our group is contact our intermediary in, say, Germany and pay them instead, and they will get the money to us. And so it was that one U.S. corporate victim was directed towards a Gmail address. Gmail address of someone who was claiming to be in Germany. PierreRomar.mail at gmail.com was the email address. And the company, which had been victimized, began to negotiate. And eventually, they agreed on a sum of money. 
that there was another spanner in the works. You see, the, the legal department in the hacked organization wanted assurances that the hackers would keep their word. You know, they say, they've stolen our data. They say they won't leak it. How can we be sure of this, say the legal department? And so what the legal department says is, okay, we'll pay the ransom, but only if the extortionists commit to never releasing any of the data that they have stolen. So what they wanted was they wanted them to sign a contract. And they said, just fill in this form, get this contract back to us, and then we will pay you however much money which you want. All the legal department needed on the contract was for the hackers to fill in the bit of the form, bit of the contract which said name, address, scan of passport. And that, of course, is exactly what the hacker did. Filled in the form with his real details, a real scan of his passport, which is why we know Pierre Romar of the Syrian Electronic Army, that really was his real name. And you can probably imagine what happened to him next. So when I hear stories like this, it kind of reminds me that, well, not all criminals are evil geniuses. Obviously, there are sad and very capable cyber criminals out there, and we've been talking about the impact that some of those people have been having on countries around the world during the course of this uh, conference. But the sad truth is, most cyber criminals don't have to be geniuses. Why should cyber criminals use inventive methods and exploit zero day vulnerabilities to hack into companies and governments when so often all they need to do is use tried and trusted techniques to gain access? There's no need to find a state of the art, brand new way to hack into an organization if a simple phishing attack works or just a carefully crafted email using social engineering tricks manages to dupe an unsuspecting user into clicking or running a malicious file. So yes, we need to be on our guard against state-sponsored cyber criminals who may have huge resources and funding at their disposal to break into sensitive systems and critical infrastructure. But I think we should also recognize that the vast majority of attacks are using methods which are well known, which are proven to be possible to harden defenses against by following long established best practices. And that's important because many of our organizations are reliant on suppliers and partners and third parties who you may not who may not consider themselves the potential target of state sponsored attacks for instance they may be vulnerable to very simple attacks which ultimately then lead to an attack against critical organizations as well sadly we aren't always able to rely upon cyber criminals being as dumb as some of the examples i've given you today but i hope we can all agree that not all cyber criminals are geniuses in fact i would go so far as to say that a lot of the really smart work is being done by members of the legitimate cybersecurity industry and those who work so hard to protect our networks and track down the cyber criminals who seek to hack into them. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Graham, for this uh, exciting and very enjoyable and absolutely also very insightful talk. Uh, we would also have uh, actually a couple of questions uh, from the audience. And the first one goes, um, to what extent is survivor bias in effect here? Uh, we catch these criminals because they make stupid mistakes. Do we also catch the smart ones who don't make mistakes? <laughs> well... <laughs> If they're really smart, then I guess we don't, do we? Uh, I guess that, that then really is uh, something which is a challenge for all of us. We certainly, what we do see, of course, is sometimes uh, some changes in the way in which people are operating. So we may see gangs who actually go out of business or be, maybe they grow up, maybe they feel like they've earned enough money and they move on to do other things. Maybe they go and enjoy the money which they've stolen from businesses instead. Problem is, of course, plenty of other criminals waiting to take their place. And I think one of the challenges is so many uh, like old school criminals, people who've been involved in traditional crime, 
are actually now moving into cybercrime because they see that there are real advantages. There's, there's less chance, perhaps, of getting caught if you commit a cybercrime than if you try and rob a bank in person. Certainly, you're putting yourself at less physical risk. Thank you. Uh, there are certainly some of your uh, uh, fans among our viewers as well who have necessarily uh, looked also your podcast and uh, referred in the question that it's uh, such a great uh, pleasure to have such a security chap uh, uh, like Graham Cluley <laughs> in Saikon. Uh, but there is oh, also behave. a good question with, uh, with that, uh, that Graham, how do I teach my kids or even better, how do I teach my colleagues proper cybersecurity hygiene without being disrespectful? Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? I, I think with kids, I think you start young. I think quite early on, I mean, let's face it, most kids these days are, are sort of permanently or hermetically attached to an, an iPhone or a, a tablet device or something like that. So you can begin to teach them the importance of passwords. You, and you may occasionally test them. For instance, you may say to them, look, it's important you to password protect things. And then as the parent, you go, what's your password? And uh, you actually... Uh, tell them well done if they won't tell you the password because you say well that's good because you shouldn't tell me the password your password should be secret to you not something which you tell other people about so you begin to teach people the, the basics of privacy that way with your colleagues it's a little bit harder isn't it it's a bit like learning a new foreign language sometimes i think what you have to do is make it relevant to people so that they see the advantages so there are simple things which you can begin to introduce to just everybody uses computers, really, like having a password manager, like the benefit of two-factor authentication, about being careful about where you enter your login details and checking that you're on the site that which you think. So when you begin to explain to people the benefits and show them that it's not that complicated to do these things, they can dramatically improve their personal security. What, what upsets me is when people might see their computer, for instance, pop up and say, oh, you've got 12 security updates to install. And they kind of go, oh, yeah, but that'd be irritating. Let's delay that another day. You know, that's kind of ghouling to me. It's like, come on, if Microsoft or Apple or whoever it is are pushing out security updates and say they've got a problem, you should take it seriously and you should listen to it. Thank you, Graham, uh, for reminding this. Pretty elementary things. Uh, it's always important to go over those. And also for, for all the answers and for this uh, very last keynote at this year's Saikon, it uh, indeed was a very enjoyable discussion. And I'm sure that we have all received some great thoughts to take along. Yes, indeed. Uh, now, this brings us almost to the end of the first ever virtual Saikon. Although we would probably all prefer to meet in person here in Tallinn, we hope that you, the audience, have nevertheless enjoyed this Saikon.